Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on from um, yesterday, the other day, from, fr from Friday, whenever it was. No, so I'm leave these ones on. Th this switch. This switch. Bottom switch. This switch. This one. Look. Look what, which I'm pointing. I'm pointing this way. No, that's that switch. This switch. There you go. Right. Okay. There you go. That's the one. Okay. No, no, just leave that one. That's fine. No, I said this switch, not these lights. Okay. Listen to instructions. Okay. Amen. So we're going to carry on from where we were on Friday night. We were talking about the role of the priests, uh, the role of the priests in the Old Testament. And uh, if, you d if you missed that, it's on the website. It should be available for you to grab that. So we talked about the priests and what the role was in the Old Testament. And of course, I'm not going to spend that much time on that because I want to look at the New Testament equivalent of the priests. Remember, one of the things that we've got to understand is that God doesn't abolish anything that he institutes. Right? You know, a lot of people say God has abolished this and he abolished these things and abolished that and abolished this. And no, he replaced things. And replacing means you're taking away the first to establish the second. Abolishing means you're taking away the first and, and that's it. You don't put anything in its place. Well, that's the one thing that we really have to understand is the New Testament is not the Old Testament abolished. It's re it's so many things are replaced in that. You know, and um, I was talking to somebody yesterday Apparently, the Jehovah's Witnesses were at her door, and we're talking about circumcision in front of our two young children, and trying to explain it to her. I'm thinking, whoa, 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 it's not. And apparently, they were going on. I said, well, I said, basically, I said, circumcision is replaced. I said, with circumcision of the heart. I was telling her these things. So anyway, so the job of the priest was to sing praises to God, and that's the thing that we covered. Uh, we covered that on Friday night. It was about praises. We talked about the song, the, the admonishing and teaching songs, the songs that admonish. Uh, one another, and you know, uh, teaching and admonishing each other, you know, one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So we had teaching songs, we had admonishing songs, songs that build us up, songs that warn us. We had the psalms. The psalms were literally the psalms. Uh, we had the hymns, and hymns are uh, praises sung to God directly. Now a lot of the psalms are directed to God, um, but we talk about hymn, well, the one we sung this morning, "How Great Thou Art." It's a it's a sung hymn of praise to God. Now we classify all the things in our hymn book, but not all of them are hymns. Some of them are psalms, some of them are hymns, and some of them are spiritual songs. Spiritual song is one like a testimonial song. Like, um, you know, um, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. So we found all these things in that. So, and the, what we're going to look at today is to how they kept unity in the camp. They kept charge of the sanctuary. They were to prepare and offer the sacrifices to God, and they were to bear the Ark of the Covenant and to blow the alarms, and also to know and to teach the law. So, of course, these things are not necessary anymore for the Levitical priests because we don't need Levitical priests anymore. Why? Because there is no temple. The veil has been torn. Uh, nobody can enter into the Holiest of Holies because that Holiest of Holies is now in heaven. The only one that could enter that was Jesus, who is our high priest, he is not dead, so therefore we don't need to appoint another high priest. And we ourselves are now believer priests. As we looked at on Friday, we looked at the scripture showing that we ourselves are priests. Uh, uh, not that we should absolve other people's sins. That's not what we're talking about, priests. A priest is someone that, that gives, goes before the Lord and has access to the Lord. We ourselves are the priests of the new covenant. Okay, so here what I want you to look at is some things in here. Now, You'll notice, um, you'll notice this is the camp of the Israelites in the wilderness. Okay? So there we have the tabernacle in the middle. Okay? Now, you'll notice that you've got Judah here. right? And there's the front door. So remember, I've always taught you, you can't go th to get to the manifest presence without going through praise. Because Judah means praise. Okay? And so over here we have uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Benjamin uh, there as well. And Gad, Reuben, Simeon. Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. Um, but here in the middle, who do you think camped in here? The priests. The Levites. Right? The Levites in here. So they kept the balance of the whole camp by plonking themselves here. Because <coughs> wherever they set up the tabernacle, wherever they set up the tabernacle, this is where they faced, right, towards the east. There's the north. 
right? Like that. So they camped, and here, this is amazing to me how that without a compass, till north, south, east, and west. Well, they had instruments to be able to tell them these things. You know, it's not something new. We've been able to calculate these things for a long, long time. All right? So they faced it exactly east, and everybody can now notice that most things, a lot of things face west, you know, in modern sun worship, you know, like that. But they faced east, and here, and it faced east, and, and Judah, when they were praying, faced, faced, when everybody came in to pray, they were facing west. Because most people now, they face east when they're worshiping. You see, but they faced west here when they were worshiping. So it faced east, and they faced west when they were worshiping. So Judah here, or Judah, was at the camp, and in the middle there was the Levites who kept the balance of the camp. Yes, they had to go through praise. Okay, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, verse 14, it says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and the peace uh, shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So look, we have this communion of the Holy Spirit. What does the word communion mean? Well, it means to have in common. Having in common. So if we're having a communion with each other, we're having, we're having something in common. Right? So, for example, what does that mean? It's, it means that, um, for example, uh, Antonio is, is, speaks Spanish. So if he finds somebody that speaks Spanish, well, he's able to have something in common with them, with that way. Um, same thing, you know, you, you talk about somebody that's from Glasgow. And uh, you'd probably know that or somebody that was brought up the same area as Roddy. Well, they would have, be able to have something in common. They'd be, and they would talk about the places they went as kids or the, the people that they knew or these kind of things. Um, and so even if you meet somebody way away that grew up in your own town, you'd be able to find, you know, be able to have things in common straight away because you, you, you know this and you could have communion. You might not have communion with the Lord, but you could have communion about these different things. Now, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 says, Again, I say unto you, then if two of you shall agree on touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, let's take this in context as well, um, because the next thing it says, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst, right? So if two of you shall agree on earth, now this doesn't mean to say that we get together and we say, right, we're going to agree to do that, and God's going to do it for us. That's not what it's meaning. That's not what it's talking about. And we'll get into that just in a second. I'll show you why that doesn't mean. Now, anybody that's ever played an instrument knows the importance of tuning. Right? So I'll give you an example just right quick. All right? Let's take this guitar and uh, this one. And I'll take this one as well. Okay? So I've got these three guitars. Now, uh, this one I know is in tune. Alright, so I've got this one is in tune. And so I can pick this one up. And I've got no problems. Oops. Well, the strap's not. So I've got no problems with playing a chord on that. So apart from the strap coming off. But I take this one up. I don't know if this one's in tune or not. So I'll take this one up and see. See, this one's not, it's just tuned to something different. So, it's not bad, but not all that great. And then I'll take this one, which I know is not in tune. Okay. It's even got two strings missing off it as well. So that's completely out of tune. Now, what would happen if I decided to tune this guitar to this one? And basically, what we say is the first one. If we take this instrument and we say, okay, I'm going to tune this one to this guitar. In other words, some people would come along and they would tune their instruments to somebody else's. Right? 
So, for example, we take this guitar here, and we tune this one to this, or this guitar to this one. Now, these both guitars can play together, right? Because they're both in tune with each other. But are they all? Are they okay? Right? This guitar is actually in tune, so I get two people playing these guitars, and then I bring this one along, which is in perfect tune, but this one doesn't sound right. Because these two are in tune with each other, but not in tune with that one. That makes sense. Okay? So what would happen is, is this, guy, this guy here has assumed that this guitar is in tune, and he's tuned himself to that, when actually he's not in tune. So the one that comes along that is in tune, this is the one that sounds like it's out of tune. All right? So we've got a choice here. We can either, <clears throat> these two can figure out that they're wrong and tune to the right thing, or what do we do? The majority is not always right. right. Using a tuner ensures that each guitar or instrument is in tune. So I used my tuner this morning to tune this guitar. Now, if this guitar is tuned with my tuner, and this guitar is tuned with my tuner, now these guitars have never played together, but three of us could get together and we could all play. Would it be in harmony? Of course it would be, because we use the same tuner. We use the same tuner. So as long as each instrument has been tuned using the same tuner, they will be able to play with each other in perfect harmony. So if I use, if I use, these guitar, if I use my tuner, I can take my guitar and play along with Naomi's piano. If Bobby's fiddle is tuned using my tuner, she can come in and play as well. I don't know about tuning the drum kit. <laughs> The mandolin, if it's tuned with that tuner, it can come along and play. Anything tuned with that tuner can come along and join in the band because it's tuned with that tuner. You see? So and then any instrument that comes along and is not in tune will evidently realize that they are not out. So we have to be in tune with the same tuner. Okay? Our believers have the same type of thing. You say, what are you talking about? Well, suppose one person has a belief, right? He tells the second who accepts it, assuming the first guy is in tune. So, right, Antonio comes along, and he's got this idea. And he tells it to Brother Roddy. And Brother Roddy assumes that Antonio has studied it out, and he knows what he's talking about. So Brother Roddy accepts what Antonio says, and they both go along together. And then they come along to me, and I say, what are you talking about? That's absolute nonsense, right? It's me that looks like I'm the one that's thought to be wrong, because both of you agree, but I don't. Just because we're in the majority doesn't mean it, what's, what's right. right. So, how, what do we get? That? Who is the tuner? Who do you think is the tuner? The Holy Spirit, exactly. The Holy Spirit, of course. If I am in tune with the Spirit, and you are in tune with the Spirit, then we will always be able to agree on the things of God. You see? Now, with Antonio's belief, if he went to the, the Holy Spirit, and he got it from the Holy Spirit, Right? And then you had went and you were in tune with the Holy Spirit. And he came to you and told you these things. You could ask the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would say, yea or nay. Right? But if he wasn't in tune with the Holy Spirit and you were, he would come along and you'd say, wait a minute, that's not quite right. There's something wrong here. Because we're not in tune with the same Spirit. You see how that works? Does that mean we'll always agree? It should. It should because... If we were in tune with the same spirit, it should always matter. It should always mean that. But no doubt there will be maybe things that we differ on. And therefore, one of us, or both of us, is not perfect tune with the spirit. If I disagree with another preacher, either I'm not in tune with the spirit, he's not in tune with the spirit, or both of us are out of tune with the spirit. There is no reason why any two people cannot agree doctrinally. The Bible says in 2 Peter, and this is a biblical proof of this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let me ask you something. Did all the men who wrote down the Bible, were they all in unity with the Spirit? All in tune with the Spirit? Yes. So not one part of the scriptures disagrees with another. Not one part of the scriptures counteracts that. Yet all these men were separated over several hundred years, thousand years. But yet, they were all able to maintain unity. 
So why can two preachers not do that anymore? Why can two people not do that anymore? Considering the Bible is of no power of interpretation, the Holy Spirit is the one that wrote the Bible, right? He's the one that interprets the Bible. So I can take two guitars now and I can play a G major chord, okay? And they will be in harmony with each other as long as they're in tune, right? As we move up the neck, well, there might be places where the notes slightly differ. So let me play... Um, okay, there's it on the open, and then I'll play the 12th fret. See, it's the same note, an octave up, right? So, that's that. Now, I'll take this guitar. See, there's a difference there, isn't there? Doesn't sound the same, right? That's a fault in the guitar. There's a fault in the guitar. Okay, don't get upset. Just because it's... <laughs> okay, it's having a pity party now. Okay. It's because there's a fault in the guitar. When it was made, it's not made to the same high standards as this guitar. So we find there's a fault in the frets. Sometimes a maker might be slightly off in their calculations in the fret placement. And thus the note is not exactly perfect. So this is something we've got to see. There's a, a fault with the guitar. However, um, it's going to take major work to fix that problem. Now, sometimes in our doctrinal, doctrinal disagreements, it's going to take major work to bring us to the realization that we may be wrong and we may have to fix that problem. It's going to take some major work a lot of times. Or perhaps it's the guitarist that doesn't have his fingers in the right places and thus the problem lies with the guitarist and not the guitar. Well, this means that we have to realize that God's Word is perfect. And the problem is not with God's Word unless God's Word has been tampered with. If God's Word has been tampered with, then the problem was with that. Why do we not agree? Because I might be using a King James Bible and this guy is using an NIV Bible. And these two don't agree together. Playing the same notes in the KGV as the NIV, you're going to get different notes. Because why? There's notes missing from the NIV. There's a lot of notes missing from the NIV. But God's Word is perfect. It has no flaws. So if we have a disagreement, if we both use the same Bible, the King James Bible, if we have a disagreement, it's never the Word that's the problem. The problem is always going to be us. Right? Perhaps we've misunderstood the Word, or perhaps we've been taught wrong uh, without truly studying it for ourselves. And this is the main the problem. That people just accept a doctrine because their pastor taught it, or their dad taught it, or great-granddaddy taught it. And so it's just been accepted as such because we assume that while well, he's the preacher, he studied it out, he ought to know. But the problem is that preacher assumed that the man that he taught it studied it out. And the man that taught him had learned it from somebody else who, who he assumed had taught it as well. Or perhaps there's a flaw in another doctrine which makes it hard to accept this one. For example, if we're wrong in church doctrine, it's going to be hard for us to figure out the doctrine of the bride, of outer darkness, of the kingdoms, these kind of things. It's going to be very difficult to get that into line. The point is that if we're in communion with the Holy Spirit, then we will always be in agreement with others who are in the same communion. Does that make sense? If you're in the communion with the Spirit, you're in communion with the Spirit, and I'm in communion with the Spirit, we can all agree together. Because we're tuned by the same tuner. In the Bible it tells us, the apostles, it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, and with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. Philippians 2, verse 1 to 2 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, and if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Right? One accord of one mind. And fellowship of the Spirit, he talks about. Acts 5.12 says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all, in, they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Okay? Now, I want you to notice this. Acts 2.42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Okay? So we notice that. 
and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And breaking of bread is not communion. It's just fellowshipping, going from house to house, having a cup of tea as we would. And fear come upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And, that, and all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions of good, and parted them to every man as he had And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness, and signaled us of heart. Right? Notice these things. They continued steadfastly. They had fellowship. They had all things common. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. And what did God do because of these things? The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Why are people not being saved? Because people are not continuing steadfastly in the doctrine of the apostles and fellowship with one another. Things are not in common and things are not continuing daily with one accord. But that's where, why God cannot add to the church daily as should be saved because people are not with one accord. How do we keep in tune? The Bible says in Psalm 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Bible says in Amos 3.3, 3, Can two walk together except to be agreed? You cannot walk with someone unless you're in agreement with that person. Now, how does that fit in a spiritual context? Look at this. 1 John 1, verse 6. It says, If we say they have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and in the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Look, two cannot walk together except to be agreed. We've established that. We cannot walk with God if we're not walking in the light. God is in the light. It's up to us. God does not walk in darkness. God walks in light. It is us that walks in darkness. We have the choice to walk in darkness or walk in the light. You say, well, I'm saved. I'm walking in the light. No, you're, just because you're saved doesn't mean to say you're walking in the light. There's a condition. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ is uncleansed us from all sin. In other words, we can have a choice to walk in the light. We can walk with God. But to walk with God, we have to be in agreement with God. Now, if you, Brother Roddy, walk with God, and you, Mr. Strachan, walk with God, and each one of us walks with God, we will then have fellowship with each other. But if, we're, if one of us is not walking with God, the fellowship is not going to be good. We all have friends that we were the best of friends at one point, but now the fellowship, the friendship is not as strong as it used to be. Why is that? Because one may be walking more for the Lord than the other. So one's walking in the light, the other one's walking not so close to the light. And so the fellowship is, is not there. I've got friends like that, a couple of my best mates. You know, I never hear from them anymore. Why? Because they're not walking in the light. They're not walking in the light. If we want to walk in the light, if we want to have fellowship one with another, we need to walk in the same light. We need to be tuned to the same spirit. Now this goes for brothers and sisters as well. If they're both tuned to the same spirit, they're not going to fight with each other. They're not going to have problems with each other. Why? Because they'll be tuned to the same spirit. But when there is problems, it's because they're not tuned to the same spirit. Husbands and wives, the same thing. If they're both tuned to the same spirit, there's not going to be problems. There's not going to be issues between them. Because why? They're both walking in the light and tuned by the same Spirit. Same with fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. If we're all walking in the light and tuned with the same Spirit, there's not going to be any problems. Will there be? No, there won't be. So if there's problems, that means that we're, either one of us is not walking in the light, or both of us are not walking in the light, or neither one of us is in tune with the Spirit. Can two walk together except to be agreed? The answer is a resounding no. But if both are tuned by the same Spirit, they can keep unity. Now, it is our job, it is our job as, as Christians to walk with God and let the Spirit be your tuning fork. So when others do the same, you will automatically be able to walk in agreement. It is our job as believers, a believer priest to keep the unity of the church. Why? To be in one accord. To be in one accord. Now we are a little church. 
You know, they're the little church. But we desperately need to be in one accord so the Lord can add to this church daily such as should be saved. And that does mean that we put away the things of our old life. We put away the things that are God's to us. And we serve the Lord with all gladness of heart. You say, well, that's easy for you to say. You're the pastor. It's easy for anybody to say, but it's not easy to do. But there has to come a point where we're going to decide, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So, what you need to do is you need to walk with God. You need to let the Spirit be your tuning fork and ask the Holy Spirit to tune you. Literally, get on your knees, ask the Holy Spirit, say, Holy Spirit, tune me to you. And if he will tune you, and then do what he says. If he tells you to get rid of something, get rid of it. If he tells you to do something, you do it. And you, be your, you let him be your tuning fork. And as you go, the more you become in tune with the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to be in tune with other believers who do the same. Why can we have instant fellowship with some people? Because they're tuned to the same Spirit. They're tuned. Now, there may be a few notes that are off. But on the main things, they're tuned. Just right. So, that's the second job of the, of the priest, is to keep unity in the camp. And our job as believer priests is to keep unity in the camp. To keep unity in the church. To be in one accord. Continuing steadfastly in the doctrine of the New Testament. And making sure that we are all tuned by the same spirit. Amen? Any questions?